set. So I wanted to show you guys some games by Ollie Rice of Ferrucci today. So let's go on to that one. And I, it's been a while since I've done the stream. I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm obviously, I, if you look at my channel, you see a lot of 960 streams, Chess 960, which I'm a big fan of. But uh, I've been thinking about Ferrugia, and obviously Magnus Carlsen has been too. Ali Reza Ferrugia, originally from Iran, now in France. And he's just this phenomenal player. Um, I guess people talk about him being, a, you know, as with the new generation inspired by computers, uh, Gen Z, like to a, to a much greater de degree than, uh, let's say, even Kasparov. Um, who was kind of at the that transition in the 90s. Um, but yeah, now we have the Alpha Zero version of that, right? The newest version. Um, so it's interesting, but it's not just that. You know, I, I, people talk about, um, you know, people these days, players these days being stronger than any players in history. And, uh, you know, I have to take issue with that a bit because I, I think there are outliers. You know, you have to think about this context of, uh, look through the lens of outliers, you know, because if you're talking about Morphe, or uh, Lasker, Capablanca, uh, Polgar, Fisher, some of the greatest players ever, uh, going back to obviously the, even the pre-world champions like uh, before Stein, it's uh, obviously Morphy and um, Staunton and some of those players too. Uh, you know, they just they just have a grasp for the game, right? So, so you know, you, the computer can inspire you, you to do a few amazing ideas that you, to employ those ideas that you never would have thought of before, maybe, but at the same time, Chess requires this kind of holistic understanding, this narrative throughout, and a computer won't necessarily tell you that. They're working on explainable AI, for example, but you don't need an explainable AI to tell you that. You can learn it yourself. You can absorb the games. You play your own games. You have a good coach. You learn. You read books. You know, this chess, this mastery of chess is not, the computer can help us to do so, but we're all playing on the same board. So I just think there have been a few outliers that have almost utterly mastered the game. Obviously, Carlson's one of them. Um, anyway, so as for Ferrugia, we'll get into him and just look at a couple of games. So Magnus in particular mentioned um, the uh, European Cup, Team Cups, um, from 2021 and uh, one other tournament as well. I, think, uh, I forget the name of the other one, but I think that studying this is really great because it's like, okay, well, Magnus is basically giving you a cheat sheet saying, hey, I'm, I'm essentially afraid of this guy or amazed by him or something, right? So to, to the extent that I actually want to play against him and think he's the best um, chance that there is for um, for someone to beat me so it would be a good idea to, to look at these tournaments that really impressed magnus um so this is from i think it's called the european cup i pulled these up a while ago actually but um and i analyzed them then so it's kind of fresh to me right now which i think is a good thing to take a fresh look at it and kind of almost see it with um yeah just see it in a new way as i'm going through it i briefly scanned it right before this but i want it to be a bit fresh and uh, to kind of understand it with you as we go through this uh, and just a quick kind of chess news. So it's pretty fun. I got an article ch uh, published in Chess Life. That's like the main um, uh, American chess magazine. So let's see, uh, where is that? It's right here on a different browser. Um, so this just gives you a sense, cross-cultural chess. I work with this team from Columbia, that, um, from the country of Columbia. I visited uh, DC and uh, we got to work at the embassy. So is this this really interesting partnership they developed and uh, FIDE helped out, the World Chess Federation, U.S. Chess Federation helped out to make it possible. And I was uh, the coach and, you know, well, they have their own trainer, a coach, uh, amazing guy. And I was kind of their coach while they were here just to get, you know, different um, different style of learning and stuff. As well as um, we had a couple of others too, uh, as you'll see down here, from Moldova and from Colombia. We had a couple more um, coaches from GMs. I'm just an NM, National Master or CM internationally. So, uh, but hey, I think you don't have to necessarily be a GM to, to coach someone. Uh, the key is that you understand the game and that you are good at um, explaining it. You know, that you can explain it to people. Then I think it's, um, yeah, and you, you know, to relate to people and personalize it for them. Uh, but obviously if you're a GM who can do that as well, it's gonna be higher level, but like, um, you know, someone like Dvoretsky, I think he was a GM, right? Uh, one of those top trainers, but really the key is you can be an FM. I think like Nakamura's work with NM or something um, So yeah, or maybe an, maybe even an expert I mean someone who really understands openings as well like your second or uh, yeah Fisher worked with Lombardi who was a GM, but not obviously not as strong as him. So um, Anyway, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I was you know, teaching in Spanish So I got to refresh my Spanish uh, It was that was a challenge, but I, I kind of studied chess Spanish a bit. So that was fun. That's in this this month's chess life um, so those are some of the pictures and also um, working with the Howard University team, which brings me to this live event uh, It's happening right now, the Intercollegiate Championship. So I just got to visit today and train with them a bit to um, kind of look at some of the games in the middle of the tournament. And that's on Follow Chess, or you can see it on, on a few different sites. 
if you go to, so where is that? That's right here. Pan American uh, Intercollegiate Ch Team Championships. That's a mouthful. Um, so you can see that, you know, some of the strongest players in the country from various countries that are now an American or I think, uh, I think they're pretty much all American, like North American teams, US, Canada. I'm not sure if there are any Latin American teams. I didn't see any on the list, but they're from all over the place. Greece, uh, Israel, Turkey, Canada, um, all over the place, Poland, Colombia. But these, yeah, they're, I'm pretty sure they're all in US teams. So this is interesting to watch if you go to Follow Chess or Lee Chess, different sites have this. Anyway, now we'll get to the just a couple of updates. Now we'll get to, because it's been a while, now Faruja's Meteoric Rise. So hopefully you're, everything's working on the broadcast and you can see it all clearly and hear it, hear the sound. All right. So we got Faruja versus uh, Jobaba. I think it's Jobaba, maybe. I would want to say Hobaba, but I think it's Jobaba. So Faruja versus Jobaba, this is amazing. Again, from that European team championship. So E4, C6. D4, D5, so we have our standard Karo Khan, and Ferruja pushes. Interestingly, Ferruja has played the Karo Khan a lot with the black pieces, and I've seen some amazing wins with black, so obviously he understands it from both sides. He knows what he doesn't like uh, to see from the black side. Um, now, I don't mind uh, playing this with, with black, actually. I used to play a lot of Scandinavian, messing around with hippos and stuff, small center setups, like Nimzovich talked about, but I don't mind this in playing bishop f5. You could even play like c5, uh, like a slow French almost, but you get to get your bishop out. So there are certain advantages for black. I mean, there's trade-offs, whether you're playing a French or a Karo Khan, because obviously in the French, you're immediately blocking your bishop on c8. Here, you're not. So there's just trade-offs. All right, so he got he does uh, two bishop f5, Jobaba, knight f3, e6, bishop e2, 97. So this is pretty classical. I've actually messed around because I studied some Carlson games. I messed around with bishop b4 check. It looks kind of weird, but your bishop ends up switching here to c7, shifting here, and then you hit him with f6, and you actually get a usually a pretty good central attack and kingside attacks can spill over with the f-file, and the diagonal usually opens for your bishop, so it's, it could be kind of fun. Um, just more of a blitz move, um, but I've actually gotten pretty good positions against fms like that. So 97, castles, h6, nothing special here so far. I, I, I tend to like h6, sometimes you'll even go for a somewhat early f6, obviously c5 is your other typical break in the car con in, the, in this closed position. But again, remember, we have that bishop on f5, so black is trying to argue, hey, this is better than a standard French, because I don't have that annoying bishop that I have to solve, I have to solve uh, how, do I, how do I get him out, this conundrum. Uh, usually you go, you know, d7 to b5 or something like that. You can often find, or you just say, hey, I'm just gonna have a bad bishop and I'm gonna still strike at your center. But you know, you will usually find a way out somehow, eventually. <laughs> Um, or if you get f6 and get to break with e5, pretty hard to do. But obviously there's a big struggle over the e5 square. White wants to, Nimzovich talks about overprotection. I think we're going to see a little bit of that, that control over the center, the central dark squares that Black's going to try to strike at. Beautifully done, actually, by Ferruja. So see some of that. Um, you'll just see how to how to play against the Karo Khan actually extremely well. Uh, it's really advanced stuff, but you'll see it's kind of really across the board play too. So let's check it out. Now h6 allows the bishop to retreat. You never know, sometimes actually black does play g5 too. So just some of the motifs you'll see, just to give you an overview. Um, but obviously this, this allows you to preserve your bishop because we like our bishop on the diagonal. Can be, annoy him on the c2 pawn too. Sometimes you even go to e4. Sometimes you decide to go to g4. Very flexible. You might want to replace the bishop with the knight too. So knight bd2. And by the way, you would do that in order to attack the d pawn with c5 and knight c6. So again, kind of typical um, French themes with the inclusion of a bishop that's out there, hopefully not sticking out his neck, not sticking your neck out. That's why you want to be able to tuck him back. And he doesn't go for the um, Jobaba. I don't think he goes for the G5 stuff. It's very risky. But then again, you can castle queenside. So black doesn't have to show his cards either. Okay, knight d7, knight b3. So this is an interesting way to play. Uh, I think he's taking the restriction route, saying, hey, you're going to have a hard time playing c5. I can go bishop b3, enhance my control over c5 with the x-ray, right? Even though the bishop looks pretty bad, but you can possibly go here. At least he uh, reinforces the central dark squares. And hey, make them work. Make them work for uh, c5. So if we could throw our a pawn at them and bother them over there. And obviously you have your traditional kind of, especially in a regular front, you'd have f4, f5 without the bishop without the, the bishop being out there. It's a little harder to achieve, actually. So that's why we kind of see this across the board play where he says, I don't have to commit to f4 and g4 and f5 or something. That's great. Uh, especially, again, especially against a, a French with a standard setup with the bishop back here. 
But if you can strike at that bishop, you might do it and get f five in. But he doesn't really force the issue there. So bishop tucks back voluntarily, gets in his little cave, can sm snipe out of his cave. Pawn a4. So there's that a4 move I was talking about. Actually, when I taught the uh, international adult class uh, about a month ago with this, I had them guess every single move. Just figured I'd play guess the move with them. This took them a little while. This one was tough, but they ended up finding it. Actually, I'll, I'll give a shout out. Um, that was Uday. That was Uday from Mumbai. He found it. He found some really good moves here. Actually, he's getting. He's. He might become the next version. Who knows? A4. He's very good. A6 gives me a hard time. Bishop d2. Okay, so he actually didn't opt to go bishop e3. He opts to go to d2. Then he can kind of, you know, maybe come this way too. Maybe support the a pawn. Maybe just come out to b4, a5. Let's see what he does. Queen c7. Now, keep in mind, throughout the game, Prusa is super flexible. That's a trademark of his play. It's a hallmark of his play. A lot of flexibility. Queen c7. We like flexibility. Rook c1. Now, note, uh, sometimes I've actually seen a re recent Magnus game. He played c4 against this Karakan uh, with the advanced variation. But he says maybe he's shown, you know, forecasting that he might play c4. But he doesn't have to. He might play c3. He might do nothing, right? You see what he does. But he's making his opponent think. Making him think. Making him wonder. Because there's no, we keep in mind, this is a closed position. In closed positions, you want to maneuver. It's not about having your pieces out. It's about the best places for your pieces. Silman does a very good job, Jeremy Silman, discussing closed positions, imbalances, how you handle closed positions, maneuvering and stuff. Rook d8. Okay. A little, a little weird. I mean, you figure the rook might want to be on the c file, but. He's kind of giving up that idea, I guess, of C-file action, which is exactly what Frugia wants. He's restricting C5. I don't know. Um, I think he does get it in, though. We'll see. So Bishop A5, a provocative move, right? You're like, well, you're just going to get hit by B6. Well, think about some of the advantages for white if black goes B6. I mean, he kind of has to, right? I don't think you want to go knight B6 and have this nasty pin. So um, that's just going to get attacked eventually. So he ends up playing B6 then to not lose the exchange. But then notice that it sort of softens the structure very much so actually, because you notice c6 gets softer, but particularly the a6. a6 is just dropping on the next move if you don't do something. So you can kind of gain a move um, after b6, bishop, b4. Now we hit the diagonal. Now again, a provocative move. He's allowing c5, for example. But c5 doesn't actually, tactically doesn't actually work, right? It's like, well, you gain a tempo on the bishop. No, it doesn't work because when you take, if well, I, I assume he would take back with the pawn, but then he's going to run into this again. And then, it, okay, didn't really achieve anything there. And um, he's still pinned. And black is striking back a bit in the center, but I don't know. This just feels very uncomfortable for black. I guess I guess he can go ahead and try to take on e5, but that, that just doesn't feel right. Uh, just feels very dangerous because black is not developed very underdeveloped here. So I imagine if he takes on e5, what can we do? I mean, at the very least, we could even grab the knight and then take the b6 pawn. I think the, the queen side play looks really strong here. If you take on b2, you just take on a6. Just keep on taking stuff. And we have bishop b5 check and all that. And we have two connected pass pawns that are coming. So that looks like probably winning position. And again, the the black uh, position is underdeveloped for Jababa, so. So c5 doesn't work. He goes for a5. Oh, by the way, if you go c5, let's say the knight takes back, okay? The knight takes back. Um, Now we can take our pick. It looks like, again, I'm not running computer analysis, just trying to understand this. I, I figure um, you can win the a6 pawn for sure, at the very least. You don't need to, but also keep in mind, well, he never got to control d4 then. So you still have some weaknesses. You might even probe at his position with a5. I imagine if you really want to win the pawn, you can. You could just take... This looks very strong, actually similar to the game. And then we can go for bishop b5 check, which is very uncomfortable. And uh, we can put some pressure against the black center. And we're up a pawn, right? So b6, bishop b4. He doesn't decide to play c5, he goes for a5. But you definitely, that's the kind of thing where if you're going to go for bishop a5 and then bishop b4, you have to ask yourself, is, am I going to get hit with c5? Because if, if that works for black, then this is actually looking really good for him. So you have to guarantee that it doesn't work. Now that's, again, like this... Going back to the computer idea as well, a lot of humans might not like the look of this, but you look at all these computer lines, you're like, actually, that that's possible. Why not? Okay, a5, bishop b6. Well, let's probe his position. Let's bother him. Yeah, the bishop will probably get traded off. We gain a tempo. Actually, it's white who, white who ultimately gains tempos here. Bishop, uh, queen to b7 after bishop d6, queen d2. Coolly bringing out the queen. Remember, you can always push the c-pawn. I'm sure a lot of players would love to play c4 and try to get some action on the c-file, but he's, you know, people don't like uncertainty in general, uh, but he can handle the uncertainty. He doesn't need to force anything. Keep in mind, you know, it, you're always going to open up the d5 square. So if you do something like this, 
I think that looks not so bad for black to have this knight trade it off and trade out the bishop, which is uh, going to give some pressure on the d-file as well for black. So he's not in a rush to make c4 happen. Queen d2, knight c8. Okay, now you have to trade. The knight had to retreat, though. Keep in mind, it's kind of tempo play. It's a closed position, but he is he is gaining time. I mean, if you can open the position, the white's pieces are certainly more mobilized for um, Ferrugian. So knight takes f8. Knight e1. Now, why do you think he played knight e1? It's actually a really deep move. But, so this is the first really, uh, first time maybe we had bishop a, a5 to b4. That was really nice. And also the fact that he's patient on the c4 push. And then... We have the 91 idea. So maybe pause it if you want. Think about why he did this move. It's a very nice move. There's uh, at least two ideas, I think, associated with this. Maybe three ideas. So if you want to take a pause and think about the positional ideas here. Not even tactics yet. It might turn into tactics after because tactics flow from a superior position, right? So uh, 97. 93, of course, is the natural follow-up. So first of all, we're still restraining the C5 push. So like if you play d4 openings too, we tend to like, um, if we have, let's say, uh, a nice center with d4 and c4, we tend to like to prevent our opponent from playing c5 or e5. We can restrain our opponent that way. So here, the main break, of course, in this kind of, again, it's a, it's a hard con, but it's like a French, we could view it as a French structure. So in a French structure, you want to play uh, c5. Maybe you go for f6 again, but that's actually a little point here, is that when the bishop goes back, it can't protect e6 so easily. So you have to be a little bit careful with the black playing f6 in these structures because the rook is going to open up on the e-file and try to try to bother the e6 pawn, put some pressure on it, and and by extension, get through to the king through that x-ray. So it could be tactically very uncomfortable if you uh, play f6. Now as for c5, that's ruled out, obviously. You'll just take it and win the pawn and weaken the b5 square. So knight d7, so it doesn't look like a good sacrifice to play c5. So knight d7. Now, what do you think? Okay, second idea. So one was to maybe restrict c5. Second idea, think about this knight. Where can he head? Think about a little maze. You can follow this little maze over to the king side, right? So knight, he goes knight f1, to, oh, sorry, f3 to e1, then to d3, then to f4, and now he can go to h5. And if he wants to play g6, that's fine. Then he weakens f6 and h6. So we're kind of provoking that. Okay, castles, rook fe1. Let's put some pressure on the e-file. Now remember, we talked about the f4 idea. That's kind of pointless. It's not going to really get f5 in due to Black's control of f5 himself. So he could just get the rook out, maybe lift it at some point. But keep in mind, you know, it looks like he's going for a king's side attack, but he's flexible. The, really, the theme of this game is his flexibility and his patience. That's the really impressive thing about this game. Really mature play. So rook c8, c3. Now he didn't go for c4, but again, if you go for c4, this, we don't like this, you know. We don't tend to like this. So it happens in a um, in a queen's gambit accepted a lot. I played this a lot with black, where you take on c4, and they play the e4, e5 stuff. You provoke that, and your knight gets to sit on d5, and you put pressure on the d pawn. Maybe you hit him with c5 at some point. So, and now he's castled, so he can open up things more. Black can open up the position more with with less risk. So it's you know you have to be cautious about c4. Think about your opponent's uh, opportunities or going to Dvoretsky, uh, your opponent's resources. So c3. Nice pawn chain, why not? Supporting d4, rook c7, aha, g4. So he is going for the king side now. Gaining space on the king side, not to mention stopping any pieces from entering f5 for now. Maybe we can get a bayonet at some point, or maybe we can always just expand with h4 and probably want our knight on h5. Well, let's see what he does. Queen b8, queen e3, just continuing to improve. We can swing laterally now. Queen d8. So he went b b8 to d8. Now uh, my my guess is Jobaba was playing a little defensively. He's like, all right, I'm in a bad position. This is not a happy position for me. So I'm gonna um, try to bring my queen closer to my king. As you've seen probably many games, um, Art of Attack covers this by Vukovic covers. You kind of displace the opponent's queen on the queen side. You can often sacrifice a lot because the queen's not nearby to defend. Um, so she's trying to get a little closer, probably not to mention some kind of counter tactics on h4 g5 so that might be her best defense to do some counter attacking over here not to mention just kind of being closer it might go to e7 eventually or something so she can be nearby h3 patient play again he wants to go to h2 with his king supporting the pawn if you go to h2 you might bring your rook to g1 as well but he's not in a rush he's just taking his time king h8 because again it's a closed position knight d2 well here comes the other knight so this knight served its purpose on b3. It was restricting. Uh, it was also, keep in mind, like c5, for example, you can, like, 
he couldn't play earlier because of this, the weaknesses on that you'll see on the queen side. Now you can take, take, possibly just take the A pawn. Mm, it's rook A7, but I think you know something that was available, you know. But so that was always there. But now he's shifting his attention to the king side. So he said, "All right, I've done some things over there. I've restricted my opponent, but now I've, I've built up my king side attack a bit. So let's come on over with the knight too. Let's come over to F3." So he does get a c5 in. Weakens b5. There we go. This should be 5 So remember, across the board play. Flexible across the board play. Holistic play. Board vision, right? No no tunnel vision. Full board vision. So bishop aims in here. Now this has some tactical ideas. It's just annoying being on b5. It's a good outpost. You can't really attack it anytime soon. It's got some nice scope. Doing better than it was, right? And he doesn't go to d3. You don't need to trade off this bishop just yet. Let your bishop do its work, but we're aiming at the knight too, which will be relevant, you'll see. Knight c6. We got our king h2 in. He can't attack us on the dark squares we, as long as we keep a strong diagonal. If you have to, you can go back. But we don't want to go to h1 in some cases. You might run into like a bishop check. Happens to guard his pawn on h3 in some cases, but he just can't be bothered on h2, so it looks like a good spot. You see Karpov making the most king moves of any player, I think. So it's uh, kind of Karpovian, this sort of king maneuver. C takes d4, c takes d4. Knight to b4. Okay, so it, it seems, at least superficially, that Shobaba has achieved that c-file counterplay. And this is refuted brilliantly. I really like this. This is actually probably my favorite idea of the entire game. I, I, it was, at first, it caught me by surprise. It's because, again, we're, we're, we're going for our kingside attack, it seems. Rook takes c7, queen takes c7. Okay, what do you think you did? Might want to pause for this, this moment as well. Really brilliant idea by Ferugia. It looks like we have to deal with knight c2, right? I mean, that's kind of a threat. He wants to win the exchange with the fork, knight c2. Um, just getting pressure in general on the c-file. It is annoying counterplay. If you want to just go about your your play on the king side, you're going to you're gonna be disturbed a bit, right? You can't just go about uh, unscathed, right? It can often bother you on the queen side and kind of cascade over to your king side through some weaknesses. So we're not going to let him in so easily. Okay, what's the move? Queen c3. I love that move. Queen c3. So he's just directly challenging the file, but it's so surprising because you're like, wait, wait, he wants to checkmate black here. He's going for Shobaba's king. Why would white play queen c3 and allow a queen trade? Well, that's the thing. He's not really allowing a queen trade. He's just challenging the c file. He's trying to dominate the c file. But, but why can't the queen take? Think about that as well. Why can't the queen take? Oh, remember that. Remember this bishop. The bishop is doing a perfect job tactically because it hits the knight on d7. Because remember, when he takes, you're going to take back with the pawn and hit the knight on b4. And also, it's pretty hard to escape. If the bishop's taking away the b4 knight's escape squares and it hits the d. You simply, uh, well, like, let's say, for example, um, takes, takes, well, the knight's hanging. Knight c2, rook c1. Now, the bishop is still there, but now you see why we didn't want to trade off bishop. We're the one attacking. Got pressure here, pressure on c2. So let's say he defends the, the knight with, like, rook d8. Now, what I was thinking was, again, I didn't run the computer analysis, but I'm thinking we probably just want to trap this guy because the only way he can escape is a3. I'm pretty sure this is going to win. Knight b1, retreat your knight. So this is what he had to see when he played uh, queen c3, assuming this works. I'm pretty sure it does because after knight b1, where is he going? Right, he's tied down. The rook's tied to the knight. Again, showing the, the, the strength of bishop to b5. And the knight can't escape. It's, it's demanded by the bishop, but, but not for long, right? Because we're going to then contest the diagonal. And the thing is, you can't even do some stuff with like rook c8 and try to escape through the pin because you have to deal with the knight on d7. So he's just completely overloaded in this position. And now we're about to have a trapped piece. We're about to win a trapped piece. So he can go g5, when you attack your knight, whatever. You just do knight d3. Game over. Pick up a free knight, and then he wins the end game. So I love this move because you can't take. So he goes rook c8. Okay, naturally we go rook c1. You still, you still can't take. Hold on one second. Oh, recording. Where is that? I forgot even where the move button. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I'm almost done. All right. Looks like we may only have time for one game. Be right there. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I don't think we're gonna get to two, but this is a great game. Maybe I'll okay. I'll have a part two then. I'll have a part two. I am being called for. Okay, rook to c8, rook to c1, bishop to c2. So this is interesting. 
it seems like suddenly like okay he has this obstruction going on so finally he's it seems like he's achieved something for Jobaba that he's challenging the queen so queen goes to g3 well, let me just make sure it's still I think it's still good let me see if I press something um what does that mean is that Russian or Ukrainian or something the UN what's the UN uh, Radian. Hey, Radian. Where are you? Where are you coming from? Where are you? Um, Radian Hassan and yeah, I think that's Russian, right? On the top. Not an expert in and I just speak pretty much just Spanish and English. So, all right. Anyway, looks like it's still working. Yeah. I don't think I pressed anything. Uh, that's going to break it. Okay. So queen to G3. Now, so technically, when you play bishop c2, because of this obstruction here, between breaking the, the connection, communication between the queen and the rook, so he is now maybe wanting to take on c3. So fine, we just move the queen, and now we're now we're pinning it, right? Now we're pinning the bishop. So the queen moves back. Then finally, he takes on d7. You're like, why does he take on d7? Well, queen takes. Then he just continues his attack. I'm thinking he didn't want the knight as a defender because imagine if you really want to break through, you know, this bishop may be able to come back. And then I can go to f8 and defend. So when you take on d7, there's not really any defenders, right? And if the bishop moves, you got to worry about pressure on the c file, which could be tactically important, some tactical weakness on the c file. The knight, now keep in mind, like he was trying to go knight to c2. He never got to do that. You know, there's nothing really important that the knight can do with his life, right? What are you doing with your life, knight? You want to go to d3? I'm just going to take you. Right? There's nothing to do. You want to go to a2? Who cares? I just move my rook. All right. So g5. h takes g5. Queen takes g5. Queen to d8. So, okay. So what? Just check him. So we've compromised his king side now. But remember, we were going... It's kind of... It reminds me of Capablanca. Left, right, hook. Right? If you look at the... Uh, look up chessgames.com. Left, right, hook. Capablanca. Beautiful game. Go for the left, go for the right, come back to the left again, uppercut, you know, just keep, just keep until he gets punch drunk, right? So remember, he was, at first he was, well, he played knight b3 and stuff, he's kind of restricting him on the queen side, showed some intention on the king side, switched back to the queen side with queen c3, then he shifts back to the king side again, so you see he's, yeah, he's getting punch drunk. He's completely off balance, right? Knight f3. All right, now, remember, the knight d2 to f3, finally we achieve this, and remember the old maneuver that he did, the, the a while ago, knight e1 to d3 to f4. That was another knight, right? And this knight went uh, knight bd2 to b3, back to d2, back to f3. So we did a lot of maneuvers. Now we have a beautiful position, and obviously our rook is ready to swing back. We can have tons of pressure on our opponent, lots of tactical ideas. We have an open half-open g file, and our opponent has a half-open h file, which he can't use, right? Actually, funny enough, the queen does come in, but she becomes more of a target, you'll see. So g6, rook g1, okay, pinning the pawn. And as I said, you know, anytime you can make this pawn move, f6 is weak. h6, f6, g7, nice complex. And also we can target the g6 pawn, maybe sack, e6, this kind of attack the light squared complex on the pawns and attack the squares, the, the weakened dark square complex. Nice c6, so it just becomes purely a pure kingside attack all out now. But he's prepared. He's thrown off his opponent, kind of keep him guessing. That's where the flexibility comes in. Queen f8, queen back to h4. Queen g7. Okay, she she's fianchettoed. The queen has been fianchettoed. Seems like everything's under control. Remember, the queen needed to be on standby to be able to protect her king, right? Knight h5. Okay, that's fine because you can't take it. I'll get your queen. I think he's fine with uh, queen and pawn for rook and knight exchange, right? So the queen's going to move. And it's a little sketchy, right? A little sketchy. The queen's loose, but I guess he's figuring, okay, if you check me with the knight, I'm just going to move my king up to g7. Then what? Then I'm trying threatening a queen trade. So he doesn't bring the knight in. He resists that temptation because it doesn't do anything. So he goes rook to g4. Rook g4, let's see what he has in mind. He's protecting his queen. He can swing to f4. He's got a few, well actually, not yet, because you want to keep the pin. And uh, we'll see, we'll see. But it looks like he's just bringing in more forces and stopping, let's see, he's protecting this pawn as well, but it doesn't matter in the, in the scheme of things. So king goes to f8, tries to run. Then the queen decides to come in. Okay, so now you can probably see pretty quickly why, why the queen shouldn't take. Obviously, the pawn can't take. Now we've created a pawn, or sorry, a pin on the pawn on g6. And if the queen takes, we're going to 
go rook h4 and then set up our mate on h8. So so again, the queen's going to have to give herself up for a, for a rook and a knight. And then we're just going to keep attacking with the extra material. So knight goes back to d8, trying to hold on to these squares. Like f7 weakness. I think, oh, there you see, I think the idea of maybe going to f4 was probably part of the rook g4 idea. Let's see if you have anything else in mind with that. Ah, right, right, oh, obviously. There was the rook h4, uh, like as we saw in the previous line. It's, I mean, sure, you might go here, but I assume then you'd have like bishop f5. So I think the main idea is to go to h4, which is what he does. And it just kind of reinforce things. But yeah, rook h4 is a very direct idea. King goes to g8. And we keep flooding his position. Once again, this knight is taboo, we'd say. He's taboo, he's immune to capture on h5. He's been uh, vaccinated, at least against, uh, immune against delta anyway. So bishop goes to d1, queen takes d8. Oh, actually, I wanted you to, I got to run, but I actually wanted you to pause on that. So yeah, too late. But okay, you can pause and figure, actually, yeah, this is useful. So you know, you don't have to figure out that he does queen takes d8, but I want you to figure out why. Figure out why he did queen takes d8. Why is it such a good move? So I definitely want to, would recommend pausing that. Try to calculate it out. What happens after queen takes d8? So brilliant move and brilliant partially because you, most brilliant moves are not brilliant because of the move themselves, especially on the grand master level. Cause like he can calculate something direct like that, but it's usually the setup that's brilliant. Cause he probably calculated this like several moves ago that he was looking for this. It's also just that he's flooding. Okay, bishop to d1, queen takes d8, rook takes d8, nine f6 check, king g7, rook takes h6 and game over. Oh, he actually resigned because he saw it was coming. But the idea is knight f6 check, king g7, rook takes h6, king takes h6, knight takes f7, and you pick up the rook and you have two knights against uh, a bishop. So that's, it's all forced, right? Because you take, he's got to take back, check. And he's going to defend the queen. If he doesn't defend the queen, then you just pick up the queen and you're still up a piece. And you're probably about to mate pretty soon too. But I mean, you're up a piece out there with a massive attack with the two knights invading and the rook. So yeah, king g7, you take, and he just, if he takes back, he gets forked. So you pick up a pawn, pick up the rook, and that's that's a wrap. All right, well, hopefully you found that useful, kind of the beginning, looking at the beginning of uh, how he wins. And I'll, I'll do a part two then. I'll at least do the uh, Sargisian Ferruja, which is a cool, kind of a grabbing material game and getting away with it. This one was more, um, yeah, this was just patience. This was a game of patience, flexibility, and making like kind of just unexpected moves. Uh, for example, I think Queen C3 was really nice. Uh, the fact that he didn't, I was expecting C4, that he, it's interesting that he never, he, he announced his intention to play C4, then he didn't play C4. So he just kept his opponent guessing. You know, he gets some tempos, which is for what, for what it's worth. Again, it's not the biggest thing in a closed position, but his, it's more like his opponent's pieces were purposeless. They just didn't have a purpose. And then I really like this idea. I really like the knight maneuver. And then obviously the, the second knight maneuver makes a lot of sense. So solidifying, again, you don't have to commit to c4, decide I like c3 better. And then he starts to show his intention is on the king side, of course. Secures his king, prophylaxis. He's gonna secure his king and he gets the bishop on a great square. Now remember, this bishop move is like, is what makes all the tactics possible. Great move. Everything in conjunction, all the combination of factors. And then this move proved to be feckless this night before, then I just got misplaced take and then brilliant. I just didn't see it coming, you know, this, it looks like, oh, he's got the file now. You can't challenge him with rook c1. Well, you can challenge him with your queen. So again, bishop b5 makes it all possible with a loose knight on d7. And again, just making this knight very difficult to retreat. It's where he becomes trapped. So he has to play rook c8. I mean, I guess he can play, uh, if you move, I, I assume he would just take the file. And that's him. Oh, no. Then he still gets forked on a2. What would he do if he moved? Um, hmm. What would be the best move there? Yeah, I don't think you want rook. I don't think you want to give him that for free. You're not going to give him that. Hmm. What would you do? I don't know. I mean, can't invade just yet. Maybe we could just be like, okay, well, I have the file with my queen. I can't really invade yet. Can't go rook c1 yet either, but maybe I'll just continue on the, do something on the king side and continue there and make you keep you guessing here. If the queen moves, you definitely can't challenge with the rook. And if the queen comes back, well, we were already there, right? No, actually, you're going to lose a piece. <laughs> you're going to take and take. So you can't even come back, right? There's no coming back. So we just have the C file. And like you did in the game, we can always swing back. And once we swing back, we might actually decide to play rook C1 and look at invading. But I don't think he needs it. It's more like he just prevented his opponent. That's the key idea. The opponent, he prevented his opponent from bothering him on the C file. 
and then he gets to go about his own plans. That's one of the, the beautiful things about restriction that you'll see in him. Great defensive players like Petrosian and uh, Ryshevsky, Karpov. They're really good at being a boa constrictor and uh, taking away, you know, taking away their opponent's oxygen and then doing what they want. So that's actually one of the greatest ways to attack. Like, for example, um, famous game uh, Petrosian, Spassky versus Petrosian, where Petrosian just seals up the queen side. You can probably find that game. What is it from? The 66 or 69 World Championship match. I think it's the 60s. I think it's the 66, you could double check that. But it's a beautiful game of restriction. So this is also a lot of restriction in this game. It's very tactical as well. And um, yeah, he's just on the attack now. And uh, I like this move as well. Getting rid of that defender. He's like, well, my bishop's kind of overstayed his welcome. He can't really go back that easily unless he wants to trade off all those guys. So he's like, let's, let's do this. Make him worry about the bishop and actually, yeah, we would definitely not want to trade off on D3 because we have to trade the knight. The knight's awful, let him be awful. Let him stay there. We go G5, we crack open the half open. Well, he has a half open H file, which we can access. We have a half open file, which we can also access. So it's a kind of a one way street for us here into his position. Making inroads. Queen H5, King G8, Knight F3, G6, Rook G1, pinning it. Infiltration, infiltration, infiltration. Uh, he, uh it's just interesting. He went up, then he went back. But again, it's almost like he's like, come in, come in, come and challenge my queen. And then I'm going to provoke your queen to go to g7 and have a defender. But then I'm going to start bothering your queen. So I want you to be there. And then rook g, obviously rook g4. The main idea is to go to h4 as we saw. And then uh, infiltration the correct way. Not with the knight. doesn't do anything. You want the queen in there. Creating some mating ideas. Got a mating net. And I think I have to go. But yeah. Actually, somebody wants me to go over there. Um, I think we're going to watch something. Okay, so rook takes h6, king takes h6, knight takes f7, check. king g7, knight. Well, again, he resigned before that, but we have a nice, uh, really nice combo to finish. All right, well, thank you for watching the stream, and hopefully, again, hopefully you gain something from it. I really love uh, the style, watching Ferruja play, so we'll continue to see him rise, and I think so, and um, studying how, trying to absorb how he wins. You can study how the computer wins, study how some of the greats have won, go back in the past, look at some of the players of the present, and you become a holistic player, become a well-rounded, eclectic player. And that's the best way to be, I think. Because you can say, oh, I love Paul Morphy or this player or that player. But really trying to absorb them all. And uh, you use whichever style or whichever, uh, yeah, whichever style or uh, whichever, whichever methods you think best suit the situation. And uh, all right. So, oh, hey, Kostas. Kostas from Greece. How are you doing? Yeah. Oh, you remember that game? You were following it, huh? Vaccinated Knight. Um yeah, yeah, the knight is very aware. Uh, he's very aware of, of what's going on in the real world as well as on the chessboard. So he has been vaccinated. Um, yeah, at least, as I said, at least um, against 